Today's lecture is on a topic of great relevance today, though it is rarely touched upon. The topic today is economics and morality. And this will be delivered by none else than the world famous economist Padma Bhushan, Dr. Koshik Basu. Dr. Basu is a very well known, well known name to us. He is the former vice president, senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank. He was also the chief economic advisor to the prime minister of India and he has held many, many more important portfolios. He is presently the CMARC Professor of International Studies and Professor, Professor of Economics at Collin University, Ithaca, New York. He is also President of the International Economic Association since June 2017. Well, I must mention here that to us, beyond all this, he is especially special because he is also our chief mentor. So we wait to hear from him. I mean, Janet Cook, Koshio, Bangla, Boltam, Kintu, economics shop dota takle, Bangla switch off Koreja. Shara Jibon, economics, English, the Korechi, Otto, economics and morality, unfortunately, English table. Uh, Shami Shubira Nondo Moharaji, Shami Shuporna Nondo Moharaj. Professor Prashantogiri, Ashok Mohan Daikane Achen, Dilip Babu, Onik uh, Lokachen, thank you very much. For me, uh, this is a great honor uh, to be giving a lecture in memory of Shami Lokeshwaranondo Moharaj. And it is a confluence of many things which makes this very, very special for me. Four things in particular. The memorial lecture of a person who made a huge difference to humanity. Ramakrishna Mission, for a very long time, when I was very small, my father used to go regularly to Belur Mott, and I would go with him. So it's a very long-standing association. Nanritam, which is a much later association. There is Prabhida here who had introduced me to Nanritam, and I will tell you about that. And finally, Kolkata. So it's the confluence of four which makes this a very special occasion for me. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I feel very happy. I realize about half of this is my relatives from Calcutta. So it's a bit deflating when you realize that a large part of the audience is my relatives. But still, thank you very much. Great pleasure for me to be here. You know, I should just say that for me, the Nanritam experience, you saw this a little bit on celluloid just now. A couple of years ago, uh, my wife who's here and I uh, decided to go with um, um, Ronjona and Bharati uh, to um, uh, Purulia to see the place. And actually, I was just totally taken in. Uh, it is in the middle of an area like that to see an eye hospital which is comparable to anything you see in rich countries in terms of cleanliness. It's poor people coming, coming, coming in large numbers, perfectly ordered, disciplined, getting their treatment. It's a magnificent thing to see that kind of devotion and it's cormo because it is carrying out for ordinary humanity doctors who are totally dedicated. It's just so marvelous that I should tell you I had my eye examined over there. Dr. Rupak Bishash was there and I quickly, I was having some dry eye problem, so I had myself quickly checked up uh, over there. So that was, and then we saw the um, agricultural extension work. That was that on the first visit. Then by the second visit, the Felix School had come up, and again we thought it would be a good idea to go and experience the school. And by then the little tree house had come up, so it's all very simple but kept with Perfectly clean place, very well run, efficient, sort of thing which I have to say is very, very rare in India. So when I sort, went to the school, the most important thing in a school is to see joy in the face of the children. So it's a happy place. 
And this comes also when for the teachers, it is not just another job to be done for the pay that you will get at the end of the month, but it is something that you're doing with pleasure. I mean, very often to see the teachers laughing and joking at some little mistake that children make shows the closeness with the children. Once again, this is really absolutely rare. And if you have not experienced this, I would tell you to go and see for yourself what the experience is like. And it's efficient. In India, we don't usually give much importance to efficiency, but the school is run remarkably efficiently. Actually, just two days ago, just after I landed in Kolkata, my cell phone was not working, the um, Wi-Fi connection was cutting, uh, cutting off. So I was telling my wife that phone, Ronjona and Bharati, I think I need to go to Purulia to be in an environment which will be efficient and to get my work done. So that really was my experience over there. You know, um, I'm, I have to confess, I'm not a religious person in a conventional sense. I'm mystified by life. I, I don't know. I don't have answers. I'm puzzled by life. But still, there are occasional experiences for me, Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. It is there some magical spirituality, the outsider's life, which always has been very attractive to me. And once small experience, which touched me in a very deep way in New York. For one year, uh, we were living in an apartment, my wife and I, on 33rd Street. 33rd Street, my office was walking distance, I would walk. Then once my brother-in-law, who's an American, married to my wife's sister, left a note for me saying that, do you realize that you are living on the same street where Shami Bibekanando lived in 1894 and 1895. And the house address is 54 33rd Street. I have to say it gives you the shivers to know that you're living on the same street. And 1894, it's a totally different America and we hear descriptions. After that, I've been reading a lot. I repeatedly would go to where the house was. The house numbers have changed, different houses have come up, but I more or less know where the spot is. And the feeling and the descriptions I've read now, I've read a lot about that period. In his saffron clothes, very poor people all, all around in, in the streets. People, some laughing at him, joking at him, but the love and affection and him striding forth in the streets was a remarkable figure over there. There are also beautiful descriptions of his humanity. Like there is a little description by Josephine MacLeod saying that seeing a black woman holding hands with a white woman Vivekananda says that that is what life should be, the togetherness, the inclusiveness he talks about. Then visiting ordinary churches over there, sitting in a church, he whispers to Sister Christine that it is the same God. It's this broad humanity, this ability to be an outsider in some sense to the world and have lessons for all of us is to me an absolutely remarkable thing. And in today's India, where unfortunately we are getting narrow-minded, we are defining ourselves by hate. The message of inclusiveness, which was so dear to Ram Krishna and Shami Bibekananda, it is a part of our country, the greatness of the country, the tolerance, the acceptance, it is worth remembering. And I'm once again very honored that it is in that Ram Krishna mission and in memory of Shami Lokeshwarananda that I'm giving this lecture. My lecture is going to be relatively boring economics, but with morality. I personally feel that morality should play a very important role. Morality not in the conventional sense of one religious text or anything like that, but there are certain basic principles of human morality which is common to us. Today there is a lot of work in evolutionary psychology and evolutionary game theory which shows that certain traits which economists give no importance to, like altruism, integrity, human compassion, these are extremely important for a society to do well. These are important in themselves. So even if you did not get economic growth out of them, these are qualities we should aspire for. But there is also a connection between economic development and many of these qualities. And that is what I want to speak about exploratorily in this uh, lecture, because this is a huge topic. 
Economists have usually stayed away from it, but I have to say there is now a small literature. People are beginning to look into this, so it is growing, and I do have my plate full. I'll focus and pick on a couple of topics and speak about them. You know, the problem with economics, first of all, to start with a complaint, we speak the right language, we'll speak about welfare, we'll speak about well-being, human progress, but it's in a cut and dried way that economics is situated in a broader, you can use the right language, go through the right motions, but without the perception, which has to come from the broader situating of economics in the broader disciplines. I should tell you, going through the motions and appearing to the right thing, I have a trivial story, but I must tell you. There is an American economist who goes to China, and he's giving a lecture, and he's wondering, if he should tell the Chinese audience a rather complicated joke. And he's hesitating. He's saying this is being translated. Will the joke survive the translation? But still he goes through. He tells them the joke. And when he finishes, the audience erupts in laughter. So he's very pleased that the Chinese audience has followed me. They do the right thing in response to a joke. In the evening at dinner, his, he is seated with a dear friend from China from a long time ago, he said, I have to tell you, he tells his Chinese friend, I'm just very impressed. How did the man manage to translate this complicated joke so that the audience laughed so much? The Chinese friend said, I've known you from a long time, so I'll tell you how he translated. When you were telling the joke, the translator said, now the American economist is telling you a joke. Please laugh. That was the instruction and the audience erupted. So they, they went through the motions of the right thing, but they had no idea what was, was talked about. And I feel in economics often, when we talk of well-being, welfare, the right terms, the largest context in which these are situated is not picked up and captured adequately. And that is what I am going to today give you a sense of. You know, uh, economics, we usually treat it as starts in 1776. Like every discipline, there is earlier and earlier work. 1776 is Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. But before that, of course, there was David Hume who was thinking about it. There is Kautilya in India writing about ideas of, on fiscal policy. There were the Greek think thinkers. But 1776 is the landmark of Adam Smith coming into economics. Adam Smith's one central thesis which has misled, I think, a part of economics, that was not meant to be the message, is the theorem concerning the invisible hand. If I may very briefly tell you what this is, this is a central message in economics. We learn it in the first lessons. And nowadays, there are actually formal mathematical structures explaining this. The invisible hand is the following, which struck Adam Smith, and he wrote it up in The Wealth of Nations. You know, when you look at the butcher who brings meat to the dining table, the baker who brings bread to the dining table, the clothes maker who provides shirts. At first sight, you may wonder, how come they are doing all these things which we need? Are they just good, charitable human beings? And Adam Smith said that does not have to be. Even if they are selfish, there is something called the invisible hand of the market. They do it in their own interest, but in the end it serves our interest. The butcher wants to earn some money, the baker wants to earn some money, the uh, tailor wants to maybe buy meat so he produces clothes. Each works in his or her own self-interest, but society functions and becomes optimal. This is very often called the invisible hand theorem. By the way, Professor Omurto Sen, my uh, guru, my uh, advisor, has written beautifully on the subject of the invisible hand theorem. This became central. And later, this became a center of orthodoxy in economics that all you need is selfish drive and the economy will do well. Make more profit, do more for yourself, and the invisible hand will bring order to the market and market will produce and deliver optimally. This was really a misunderstanding of Adam Smith. Also, we know for a very interesting reason, Adam Smith, when his book came out, the invisible hand, for lots of people who know nothing else about Adam Smith, they know about the invisible hand theorem, that be selfish, you'll get optimality. 
But Adam Smith clearly did not think that this is the central message of his book because in his lifetime when the book came out, the expression invisible hand did not appear in the I index which he himself prepared. So for him, it was an important finding. He put it in. He did not realize its centrality. And if you read Adam Smith, his earlier work, especially the theory of moral sentiments, he talks at length about moral sentiments, the importance of morality, the importance of ethics, the importance of human compassion. But all that vanished. E economists began to run centrally with this theorem. I'm going to, since I'm giving you a mainstream lecture in economics in many ways, but coloring it with this, I must tell you one set of experimental results, which I will put together, experiments were actual, which reveals something very important about society. If you take a textbook of economics and want to read, human beings are all the time exchanging and trading. And this we must realize that modern life is made possible by trade and exchange. If you had to do everything for yourself, produce your own food, produce your own clothes, write the books that you will read, you would be extremely inefficient. You'd be doing a thousand things that you're not good at. Modern society is made possible through specialization and exchange. All I do is write papers in economics, but that brings me food that brings me clothing. Someone else just produces food, but then trades and exchanges. Trade and ex exchange is the essence of modern economic life and allows us to be as prosperous as we are today. If you take a textbook of economics, in order for there to be trade and exchange, you just need three axioms, we call them. And the three axioms are very simple. We must want more rather than less. Striving for acquisition plays a role. So axiom one is people prefer more rather than less. Axiom two, this is called the law of diminishing marginal utility, which is very prominent in economics. But even before that, uh, mathematician statistician Daniel Bernoulli had devised it to solve a paradox. The law of diminishing marginal utility says, if you have more and more apples, the satisfaction that you get from apples will keep diminishing. The first apple is delicious, second one is less so, you don't get as much joy, third one even less. This is the law of diminishing marginal utility. So more is preferred to less, law of diminishing marginal utility, and then initial endowment disproportionate. I have all the butter, someone else has all the bread. These three conditions and there will be trade and exchange. Economists have tested some of these. The law of diminishing marginal utility was tested for rats. This was done in Texas, Austin, Texas. Very well done controlled experiments. I won't go into the details, which shows that rats satisfy the law of diminishing marginal utility. Rats are all the time scurrying about for more food, so they also satisfy the first axiom. Then, the uh, Swedish economist Karl Warnerid has talked about another experiment some people were doing, and I don't know why you do an experiment like this, to see if rats will do trade and exchange. So these experiments gave all bread to one rat and all cheese to another rat, and they were waiting to see if there will be trade and exchange. And they found, the experiment showed that no, there is no trade and exchange. I would not even do that experiment. I would say I know that they would not trade and exchange, but they've done it. Now see, all three axioms are satisfied by rats, but rats do not trade and exchange. Why? The reason is these three mechanical axioms are not enough. For trade and exchange, we need many other things, which are usually in, so implicitly assumed by economists that we don't even acknowledge them. For one, you need language. When you're doing trade and exchange, you have to say, I'm giving you two pounds of something, I want three kilos of something else. You have to have language. You have to have minimal principles. I respect another person. I will not jump and grab and take away the other person's belongings. Lots of values, social norms, which we take for granted, have to be there before trade and exchange is possible. The assumptions that economists write down are assumptions over and above after those conditions are satisfied. 
And those conditions, those other conditions, can be more or less in different societies, and different societies function differently. I believe, for instance, human beings basically are very, very similar. Across castes, across religion, across nationality, white skin or brown skin, we are fundamentally very similar. Go a little bit into history, you don't have to go very far. We come from common genetic roots, so we are the same people. It's not surprising that we are in fundamental ways very similar. But we behave and display very different kinds of behavior. For instance, consider corruption. Corruption is a painful problem in our country. It's rampant, it's all over the place, and if you are an ordinary citizen uh, um, living everyday life, you realize it. And I realize at times why if you've had a career in government all the way through, you're a bit handicapped. You don't know how big the corruption is because I went into the Indian government for three years. Before that, trying to get a driving license, trying to file my income tax return, Every second place I would encounter, someone would stop me and ask for a bribe. When I was in government, I would get that respect nowhere. I have to say during my three years, no one ever asked me. So at times I feel people who have had their entire career, it's easy to forget that there for ordinary people, it is an encounter which is not good at all. This is true not just in India. Corruption is rampant in China. Corruption is rampant in Brazil in a whole host of countries. And at times you begin to feel that corruption probably has to be there. That's a part of life. But that is not true at all. Societies have changed dramatically. If you read descriptions of United Kingdom or Sweden 200 years ago, corruption is rampant. In Sweden there was a term called the sportler. Sportler is somewhere halfway between a bribe and a tip. For everything that you interact with an official, Every second thing, you have to take out some sportler from your pocket and give it, otherwise the job will not be done. Within a 100, 150 years period, Sweden, Britain, they cut down corruption, came down dramatically. It's also happened in other countries which are closer to home and happened over very short periods. Singapore and Hong Kong were countries, regions, economies with rampant corruption. It's over a period of just barely... 20, 30 years that corruption has come down just dramatically. So much so, I'll, I'll give you some numbers from Transparency International. Uh, Singapore today is a less corrupt country than, Unite, than uh, United Kingdom. US is behind the United Kingdom, but Hong Kong is less corrupt than United States. So these are countries which are now competing with countries which are relatively less corrupt in terms of everyday life. And in case you're curious, the scores are the least corrupt is 100. That's the way Transparency International does. The most corrupt is zero. No one gets 100. No one gets zero. The world's leaders, according to Transparency International, are Denmark and New Zealand, the least corrupt countries with a score of 90. Then with a little bit of gap, there is Singapore with 85, UK with 81, Hong Kong with 76, uh, United States with 74, India is at 40. And you feel bad about this, that do we really deserve to be there? And once again, my feeling is we don't. And one thing we have to realize, it's not everything about economic incentives. You tell economists about corruption, and they will say, well, we have to tax correctly, we have to give benefits correctly, and th the problems will be solved. I don't think that is correct at all. Let me very quickly give you one example which to me illustrates this. You know, in Indian government schools, teacher absenteeism is a very big problem, huge problem. Uh, there was a very powerful research team from the World Bank and from uh, Harvard. They got together and they studied a whole bunch of countries. They did it in statistically very careful terms. They chose a whole bunch of schools in India, government schools, some 3,000, with a randomly chosen, random selection, so it's respect to Prashanto Mohalanobis, so done properly. And then they showed up suddenly in these schools, and they were looking for the percentage of teachers who are not there. And it turned out that 24% of the teachers were absent during the middle of school day, they were doing something else. In their small sample, it's not a very big sample of countries, the only country that did worse than India was Uganda. 
You tell economists about this, they will immediately say that, well, you have to increase the salary of the teachers, you have to give incentives for teaching properly, you have to punish and fine them if they don't. Maybe. I mean, I, as an economist, I am aware that economic incentives do play a role and you have to do some design. But that's not the only thing. For one, within India, where the rules and incentives and salaries are the same, the difference across states is huge. There are some states where the teacher absenteeism is like a developed country, some states where it's astronomically high. So there is something more to this than just that. And we were talking of Nanritam. There, I think the teachers take a joy in the work. Risk, they feel honor in what they are doing. And that is what, of course, you need a decent pay and all. You want to survive. You want to do well. But that's what drives them. And they do the job. I used to, when I look back at my years at the Delhi School of Economics, Delhi School of Economics in many ways was a very lax place in terms of permissions and things like that. You want to go on leave, you go and in my days, Mrinal Dr. Chaudhuri was the chair. You go and tell Mrinalda that Mrinalda, I want to go on leave. Mrinalda will say, as long as you do it responsibly, one or two days, fine, you don't have to give anything in writing. Now, I don't know whether that's the right thing to do. Mrinalda's now gone, but I've told you already he used to do that. But it was such a place of honor because we took such pride in the work that we did. That Delhi School of Economics, though no one checked whether you're taking the classes or not, you're very easy to take leave, people did their work. We just took pride in the work that we did. And that element is very important for the police who takes bribe regularly. If the police begins to feel honor and respect for the job that you're doing, that itself begins to give you a sense of fulfillment. Unfortunately, in economics, we have given too little importance to these surrounding factors which drive human motivation and behavior. When I was at the World Bank, um, I, I had to push very hard. Uh, the World Bank brings out something called the World Development Report. Every year, one report comes out on some aspect of economics in the developing world. The first year that I was there, the report that we commissioned was on economics and psychology. There was a lot of resistance from economists saying that why do you want to dilute the discipline by bringing psychology into this? I mean, it's important enough, just pure economics. But the reason I was interested in is I knew of a series of experimental results which shows you the power of human psychology and again the joy and happiness that people feel which makes a difference. These results, statistical results, till I saw the actual numbers I did not believe. Uh, two sets of results. One was done by I'm forgetting the name, Nalini Ambadi and her co-authors at Harvard. This was done in America. A um, group of girls, girl students, were gathered in a room and they were repeatedly reminded that they are girls. And the assumption being they would be given mathematics test. And you know the presumption is that boys are better than girls in mathematics, so they are reminded they are girls and then they take the maths test. And they perform not too well. These were Asian girls, by the way. Then again, they collect another group in the class, same Asian girls, and remind them that they are Asians. In the United States, there is a general belief that Asians are better at maths than others. Remind them, it bolsters their pride. Then you make them take the maths test, they do much better. So reminder of your status makes a difference. And then on this, there were experiments done in Uttar Pradesh by Carla Hoff and Priyanka Pandey, which to me was a very moving, very touching set of experiments. They gathered students in a class, village school. You make them take very simple IQ tests. Don't remind them their caste background. They take the IQ test. Their performance is upper caste, backward caste, virtually the same. Statistically, there's no difference. You again collect them, and they did this many, many times in different schools to see if it's statistically correct. Collect the students, remind them their caste status. Don't hurt them or anything like that, but you're so and so caste. You are a Brahmin. Have this discussion. At the end of that, ask them to take these IQ tests. The backward caste performance collapses. It does something to your psychology that your performance collapses. So innate ability being same, you can damage it or you can inspire people just through these psychological 
little maneuver. So the World Bank report, I, if I may do an advertisement for a report where I was involved in commissioning this, is all about a series of psychological prerogatives which human beings changes the kind of behavior that you see in human beings. And the case I made when in the World Bank we were doing this and people were saying we don't want this kind of a report is the private sector is already using human psychology all the time. So for people who are doing good work, trying to take development to the field, for them not to use psychology is leaving it to the private sector to do it for its own profit motive. And one example which I used to give, which is very well documented, uh, in America it happens, by now it must be happening in India as well. Suppose you want to buy mm, a refrigerator. You'll go to a refrigerator store in America. When you're entering, right at the front, you will see a wonderful refrigerator, but the price is astronomically high. So you'll regret. You'll say, this is what I wanted, but it's too expensive. You go in, and I used to very often wonder, will anyone buy that crazily priced refrigerator? The answer is no. No one will ever buy it. The reason it's kept is, once you stand there, look at it, look at the price and go in, your price reference point changes. You'll buy another expensive refrigerator, disproportionately expensive, but not as expensive as that. Experiments have shown people's price reference changes, and the private sector uses this all the time. We need the people in development to learn some of these things. Today we are getting a whole lot of this, and to take it forward and make it available so that people in development, people who are working for the progress of ordinary people do actually indulge in this and take this uh, to, out there to the world. You know, I, I was talking just now uh, about the salaries and incentives that those are important but not the last word. But there I do want to emphasize that not for a moment do I think that the kind of income structure that we have in the world today or the kind of wealth holding that we have in the world today is fine. To my mind, the inequality in the world today is totally unacceptable. And if the world changes, and I hope it will change, 100 years later, when we look back at today's world, and when we look at the level of inequality that prevails today, we will shudder the same way that we shudder when we look back slavery, when we look back at the treatment that slaves used to get once upon a time. The treatment that uh, uh, untouchables in India used to get. We shudder. We said, how can human beings behave like that? I believe that the level of inequality that prevails today, not just in India, this is a global phenomenon, it's increasing everywhere, is something that if we once become a more civilized society with better distribution, we will shudder when we look at this and say that we tolerated this. You know, there are very fancy statistics all around. I'll give you one simple um, uh, statistic which shows you where the world stands. I'm sure I can get numbers like that on India, but this is on global inequality. If you take the three wealthiest people in the world, just add up their wealth, their wealth is greater than all the people of Angola, of Burkina Faso, of the Democratic Republic of Congo, 122 million people. So three people have cornered more of the world's wealth than 122 million people in the world. And even here, when I used to visit um, uh, my mother uh, when she was alive, and uh, uh, in, in the morning from Guru Shodayat Road, I would go for walks, it would strike me. I know you can't solve this problem immediately, if a child from the slum comes and we keep telling these people that just work hard and you'll do it, they won't, will not do it. And a lot of the poor work very, very hard. There is also a social collective responsibility that we have. If they walk around in these wealthy areas and we tell them work hard, you will also get a home like this. The truth is most of them will not get a home like that even if they work hard. We have a collective responsibility as human beings, collective responsibility that, once again, I have to say, the Ram, uh, organization like the Ramakrishna Mission work towards that upliftment of people, and that is the kind of thing that we have to be concerned with in the discipline of economics. Time is running out. I want to just give you a little bit of the glimpses of one or two more things. I might take seven, eight minutes more. I don't want to take too much time. You know, these qualities in Economics, because we are told selfishness and drive profit motive, that's very important. 
begins to color our behavior. There has been a very interesting set of experiments that were done by um, Bob Frank, Tom Gilovich, and one more author. I'm doing injustice to the author, but I'm not remembering right now. Three of them did this experiment where they got students in a classroom and made them different disciplines, made them play games, games as in game theory, where how you play the game will show how selfish you are. And it was discovered, this is a published paper, economic students play more selfishly than students of other disciplines. Now, I like to be generous. I don't think that economic students are more selfish. But if in book after book you're told that it's selfish and the profit motive and the selfish drive which makes the world, everyone is like that, you want to be normal and you want to behave like that. But that is not the normal human trait. Fortunately, the rise of game theory and with that what is called evolutionary game theory, where we are looking at using evolution not just to understand the giraffe's neck or the lion's structure, but human social norms. There are people who are arguing it started with a biologist, very eminent biologist, who had some Calcutta connection. John Maynard Smith wrote some papers where he says human traits are also evolving. Some survive, some don't survive. So what you see among us is through a process of evolution. And there is a lot of studies now showing that altruism, compassion, these actually make societies more survivable in the long run. And you can, I can give you a whole lot of little examples from which you will see the power of this. You know, in economics, we are continuously striking deals and bargains. And that's how life progresses. I buy a home, I go to a bank, and I tell the bank, give me a mortgage for 30 years, I'll pay you back over the 30 years. For these big contracts, we sign have a formal contract, we know if I try to run away, the courts will get involved, I'll be pulled up. But life is not just mortgage contracts. We are signing contracts, tiny contracts all the time. When I take a taxi and come here, I've implicitly told the taxi driver that at the end of the journey, after you have provided me your side, I will give you the money for the payment. Life is full of little such transactions. Societies that manage to develop trust and integrity, manage to perform many more trades because you trust one another. And this is again not an innate trait of Indians or Peruvians or the Japanese. We know societies have changed. Societies have managed to develop trust among one another, among Asian countries, Japan, to a certain extent even South Korea, today are very trusting societies. You can trust one another. Scandinavian countries are very trusting countries. These are traits that can develop. What we need, we need better understanding of how these better traits can come about in society where we respect one another. Hope, I do have hope because there are examples. One striking example is not smoking when there are other people in a crowd. When this first started coming in, I used to believe in India this will never catch on. We are too individualistic. If I feel like smoking, I'll light up my cigarette. But this has changed. We respect one another. If I want to smoke, I'll go outside and smoke alone. This, is, this could be New York, this could be London. People respect one another. Human traits change. But we have to appreciate that these traits are extremely important and they need to be nurtured. I want to take five minutes to tell you about a little game, almost like a puzzle or a parable that I had developed and this game has received a lot of attention. There have been laboratory experiments and all. I want to leave you with this game in your head which illustrates the power of respecting other people, altruism, compassion, kindness, that these things can make a difference. This is just a little story which will tell you that. Two individuals have went on a journey to some distant land, say they went to a Pacific island, they've come back to Kolkata, and both of them have bought two antiques. They come here and they discover that the antique has been damaged. So they go to the airline and say that you've damaged this antique that we bought, we want a compensation. So the airline manager says, we, I will compensate you, but I don't know the price of this strange object. So this is how I will compensate you. Both of you sit down, write down a number, anything from two rupees to a hundred rupees or two dollars to a hundred dollars. 
Both of you write a number. I'll look at these two numbers and I will compensate you by this rule. If both of you write the same number, I will take that that is the price of the object. I'll give you that number. But if you write different numbers, I will assume that the person who's written the lower number is being honest. I will treat that as the price, give both of you that, but with a small reward and a punishment. The person who wrote the lower number will get that number plus $2. The person who wrote the higher number will get the lower number, I'm treating that as the right price, minus $2 as penalty for lying. This game is called the traveler's dilemma, and it's very easy to analyze it. Think for a moment. Uh, suppose you're one of the travelers. Your first thought may be, good, I'll write down 100. I can see that she, the other traveler, I don't know her, she will also surely write down 100. If we both write 100, then we are going to get $100 each, which is not bad. Actually, this was complete junk, this uh, antique, so $100 is good payment. Hundred dollars, hundred rupees, whatever you want today. Rupees sounds too little, hundred dollars treated as that. But then it should strike you, I can do a little better if I'm selfish. If I write 99, when she is writing hundred, the lower number will be treated as the price. I'll get a reward of two. So I'll get 99 plus two, which is 101. So I'll get one dollar more. So I'm going to write 99. So you're about to write 99 when it strikes you. She looks quite intelligent. By now, she must have uh, discovered the same reasoning. She's also writing 99, in which case we will get $99 each. When it strikes you, actually, I can do better. If I write 99, 98, she writes 99, I'll get 98 plus $2. Again, back to 100. So I'll write 98. Then it strikes you, she must be reasoning the same way. By now, she's writing 98. In which case I should write 97. We each want to go one below the other. And this game, and I'm using the language of game theory, you know of John Nash. This game has one equilib Nash equilibrium, which is where both of them write the smallest permitted number, say $2, and they will get $2 each. $100 escape them. Each being totally selfish drives the society, the collectivity of them into a miserable outcome. To get out of this, you have to realize that there is more to life than making that one additional rupee for yourself that you're trying to make. Fortunately, there are experiments done on this game which shows that human behavior differs. There are many places where people actually are not that selfish. It differs across societies. But this is simply the way we economists do. We usually write to, like to write things down in a very cut and dried way to illustrate a problem. The traveler's dilemma is an illustration of the problem that individual selfishness can lead you to collective doom and misery. And really for India, I feel today, it's a country that has a great distance to go, but we will not get there purely through the profit motive, purely by companies trying to make more profit. You need many other things in society, and we have to appreciate that, cherish that, nurture that. We have to include people. They feel a part of this society. Then the country will grow, and these examples are there. Japan's phenomenal growth is not just Japan making profit. Sweden's big development is when Sweden reached something called the Sultro Baden Agreement with ordinary workers and people, the big businesses sat down and they reached a social contract that we have a contract with you. Those things make a difference. And for India, while we strive with main economic logic, there is a bigger agenda that I do hope we will do research on and strive towards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Basu. This was a wonderful informative, interesting, and thought-provoking speech. You must be having a lot of questions, friends. So now we are open for a question-answer session, but time is limited, so 10 minutes of question-answers. A very good evening, sir. So you remarked that the existing economic uh, income structure in the world is not very, uh, it's very unacceptable. But uh, do you consider a redistribution of income that, that is taking income from the, those, the high income earners and redistributing it among the low ones, low income earners, or uh, giving subsidies on medical aid or social security programs? Are these consistent with ethical and 
moral laws as well as economic principles. Thank you. Should I? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I feel uh, the some amount of redistribution, quite a bit actually, is uh, called for. Uh, this has to be done. Um, you can't do it in a ham-handed, blunt way, because it is also true, I was stressing the non-economic drivers of growth, but there are also the economic drivers of growth. And we have historically in India occasionally made mistakes, made the, our rules and regulations so cumbersome that in the end, you create people who are stumbling, not being able to do their work better. But some form of redistribution is called for. And I have a feeling the world will begin to do that, because not because so much of India. This is wrenching Western industrialized countries. In the United States, the rise in inequality is just staggering. Just three days ago, we had Professor Stiglitz in Delhi. He was giving the numbers of American inequality. And this is causing a lot of disquiet among the people. So what there is now talk, and even in mainstream newspapers like New York Times, arguing that a certain amount of profit sharing, where you give ordinary people a share of the cake of the country, you have to go for, and I believe you have to go for that. And this thing statement that we make is that my income is because of my hard work. I don't believe really that there is a moral ground there also. Why are you more hardworking than another person? You did not make yourself hardworking. You are what you are. It's that you can't take credit for that. So in the end, the reward must not be just for what you're doing, because what you're doing is, in some sense, good fortune on your part that you're doing that. So I do believe redistribution has a huge role. It has to be combined, especially in today's world. You can't wait for redistribution happening straight away. So providing basic services that you referred to, food, health, and all, the government has a huge responsibility and indeed ought to carry those out. Good evening. To give three examples of countries, uh, Sweden, Hong, and Singapore, uh, with reference to the movement from corruption to non-corruption, if I may. The difference that I find with India is population, which is order of magnitude higher. I would like appreciate your comment on that, how population can play, or what kind of role it plays, and how can it be handled? You know, um, population in India is indeed very large. It's a staggeringly big country. But you could also think of each Indian state and each Indian district as a small economy. So to say, because of population, we will have to have corruption, that I do not buy. Just, just oh, and in that case, uh, uh, does the, is the federal structure, as far as the economy is concerned in India, yeah. is, is that adequate? So it's possible. So I, not that I know the solution for India, but you know, even the United States, where there is corruption in terms of big deals, uh, the military deals and all, there is corruption. But everyday life corruption is minimal. And once again, in the United States, there are studies showing about 150 years ago, you don't have to go too far back, there was rampant corruption. And the United States population is 300 million. It's not uh, Hong Kong or Singapore. It's a biggish country that has also done it. So yes, population does cause many challenges. But the corruption, no, I, for me, that is unacceptable. And I think it is possible for India. Corruption will never be zero. I'm just being realistic. But it can come down dramatically. We do need determination, but not just determination. You have to combine the determination with research with analysis as to how you intervene and do this. And the analysis has to be a combination not just of economic incentives, but social, psychological incentives as well, which play an important role. So uh, you said that this individual selfishness can lead to collective, you know, uh, while you were wrapping up. And you were talking about this profit motive of companies will take us nowhere. So we talked about the economy, but I think uh, since uh, the way you started your speech, you talked about the contemporary India, you invoked Samiji and uh, hatred. Uh, so in that context, this individual selfishness, can you extend it to the political spectrum as well? M meaning you'll have to elaborate your question a little bit more. So uh, you said that this uh, individual selfishness will result in collective doom, you know, and you were talking about uh, the, the, the world of economy, the profit motive. 
and uh, I just I'm requesting you to yeah, extend it, it from the world of the economy to the world of politics yeah. in the context in today's India's context. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very good, actually. Uh, thank you very much. You're giving me a chance to advertise my next book. A lot of it is on this, but let me tell you. Um, first of all, selfishness leading to a collective doom is too strong a word. Unfortunately, human society is capable of stumbling and continuing. Selfishness is bad. It does result in a bad outcome, but we'll probably continue. In fact, if it, but there are big risks today in the world. Collective, the political, um, you know, on this, the person who for me is the biggest influence in this thinking is uh, the philosopher David Hume, uh, writing that in the end, political power, the power of the politician, is nothing but the beliefs of ordinary individuals. And as Hume says, it is not that the dictator or the tyrant has big muscles and will come running and will hurt you. It is your fear of what others will do to you, how others will think about you. It's this collectivity that locks you into a behavior that allows the perpetuation of oppression in society. And there, I just my little hope is democracies through their election have a bit of a hope because there was a period in the United States, the McCarthy period, when suspicion of one another, everyone would be called a communist or an anti-American. And, and if someone is called anti-American, and if you say that, no, 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 that person is not anti-American, I know that person, then immediately fingers will be pointed to you. That means you are anti-American, that you're defending this. These beliefs lock you, into, uh, lock you into a political system which is dreadful. We have to appreciate that ordinary, ordinary individuals have a certain power. And this is very beautifully written by the Czechoslovakian protester who later became president of the country, Václav Havel. When he was in a prison in Czechoslovakia, he wrote an essay which is one of the most beautiful essays in plain English. It's called The Power of the Powerless. Ordinary people's power, we diminish. How they think, how they reason, makes a huge difference to the kind of, after all, a political party is not an entity. It is propped up by our beliefs. So we do have a huge responsibility as individuals.